Well, good morning, everyone. My name is David Biet. I'm director of the Canada Institute here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you here in this room, here uh, for those of you watching on webcast, and for those of you who will be watching this in the future on a webcast. So uh, welcome to the Wilson Center, which is the United States Memorial to the 28th President, our only president with a PhD, who believed that policy people ought to talk to academics and scholars, um, and there isn't enough conversation like that. So that's what the Wilson Center does, brings people together to talk about policy issues. Um, no, we don't have a, an axe to grind or a position to push, but we just want um, more informed citizenry. Um, so I think this morning as we have a great program with Earl Fry, a uh, longtime friend of mine. And um, Earl brought me to Washington a long time ago. Um, and Brian Lee Crowley, whom I've met uh, several times in Canada, and uh, a great mind and uh, becoming a prolific author again. So. Uh, with some contentious ideas um, on the rise and decline of powers. Is the United States uh, declining, or what can we do, and is Canada biting at our heels, and or just going out on its own? So <clears throat> we'll hear from uh, Earl first for about 15 minutes, and then Brian, and then we will get into some discussion, I hope. So let me turn it over to Earl. Thank you, David. Appreciate this invitation, and uh, I guess I'll start off with a little bit of the gloom and doom. Uh, and all I need to do is to push a button to yeah, I mean, at the computer. got it, got it. <laughs> all right, here we go. Just a, first of all, a slide on the bilateral relationship, economic relationship. We sort of took a hit last year, and we've been taking a hit a little bit over the past few years. And we need to keep that in, in mind. Uh, it's interesting that uh, last year there was a 33% drop in the value of Canadian exports to the U.S., valued in U.S. dollars. Can you imagine a nation which is so dependent on exports as a percentage of GDP and all of a sudden to have a third drop in exports to its uh, foremost market? In the area of direct investment, which gives uh, an investor a controlling interest in a company in another uh, country, the Canadian foreign direct investment in the U.S. now is only slightly less than U.S. direct investment in Canada using a historical cost basis. So think back to the times of Trudeau and he was worried about so much U.S. Uh, direct investment in Canada leading to the Foreign Investment Review Agency out in the oil patch, the, the National Energy Program. And now uh, uh, there, there's not that much difference in terms of the value of U.S. Uh, direct investment in Canada versus the value of Canadian direct investment uh, in the U.S. In the area of tourism, we've taken a big hit uh, there was a month last year uh, where uh, vehicular traffic going north of the border fell to levels that had not been recorded since 1972. So the Americans have been staying away from Canada in droves. Um, and, you know, 1972 versus today, the, the United States has added 100 million <coughs> residents. And still we see that in some cases our travel northward has fallen back to levels achieved several decades ago. And that's a, this is a multi-billion dollar issue. And in terms of the currency fluctuations, uh, you know, if you're a business, you're exporting, you know, you worry about this. And notice we've gone from January 2002 to the Canadian dollar being down uh, actually a little bit below 62 cents to as high as $1.10 in November of 2007. And some people at the Royal Bank, for example, are arguing that sometime next year the Canadian dollar might hit $1.15. You can see these tremendous fluctuations that you have to deal with, particularly uh, the business community, in trying to uh, take into account the, the difference in the value of currencies. And now that NAFTA is fully implemented and has been for a while, we have no big ideas out there in terms of further economic integration. There is just, we're just dead in the water, nothing being done. And so you can see that as important as this bilateral relationship is, and I consider it to be the most expansive, the most uh, comprehensive of any in the world, that we do have some challenges there. Now, let me talk about the United States. A lot of this is linked to my book, Lament for America, Decline of the Superpower, Plan for Renewal. And the main thing to keep in mind, I'm not just criticizing, I'm trying to give a, a comprehensive plan for getting back on our feet again. But why is the United States a uh, superpower in relative decline? Three major reasons. Uh, 
First of all, the rise of competitor nations and groups of nations such as China, India, Brazil, the European Union, a few others. And the U.S. share of global GDP, exports, international direct investment, manufacturing, and K-12 through educational outcomes are generally decreasing. They're generally decreasing. Secondly, we have this very potent combination of globalization, unprecedented technology change, and creative destruction. And we know what globalization means in terms of we're becoming more and more interdependent with the rest of the world and what happens in our local communities. Well, you know, it's impacted by uh, events which transpire actions uh, or, and uh, decisions made outside our borders. In terms of the technology change, you know, a few years ago we were saying that uh, our information base was doubling every half dozen years ago. Some now saying it's doubling every year. IBM scientists are saying that we're going to be down to a number of days soon when we're doubling our information base. This is just unprecedented in human history. And in terms of creative destruction, that's Schumpeter's term where we're simultaneously creating and destroying companies at a pace that has never happened before. And that includes jobs. So in the U.S., we create about 600,000 new businesses every year, but we lose about that many, depending on if it's a good year or not so good year. In terms of uh, 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 jobs, we look at 2009. We have the figures just out now. You know, we lost some jobs in 2009, but what happened was, in the business community at least, we created about uh, 25 million new jobs, but we lost about 30 million jobs in the year 2009. So you can see at the end of the day, you know, we lose so many jobs, but that's masking the fact that we have a lot of churning going on like never before. People losing jobs, people gaining jobs. And if you're a 55-year-old steel worker out there and you lost your job, how in the world are you going to match anywhere else uh, the, the, your uh, salary and fringe benefits? And uh, it also communities are uh, impacted differently. Look at a Detroit, which has lost over half of its population since 1950 versus a Silicon Valley south of San Francisco. So this creative destruction is going on in many phases of our economy and impacting a lot of people, unlike perhaps any other time in our history. And this is a very potent combination, globalization, unprecedented technology change, and creative destruction. And what this means, I believe, is that change in the future, how well nation states will do, that change may be surprisingly swift for the good or the not so good. And the third would be 15 major fault lines within the U.S. I'll, I'll put up a, a slide on that in a moment just to show you uh, what I cover in the book. So this is basically why I believe that the U.S. is a superpower still, but a superpower in relative decline. And this gives you, a, uh, this uh, diagram shows you basically how we're being impacted in a variety of, of dimensions, the international coming and having an impact on life at the local level and, and on Main Street uh, USA. And to, a, to an extent that we, again, have never seen before as globalization impacts us at the local level. The fault lines, here's the list. You can look at it when we come to the Q&A. Feel free to pick on any of these. These are the 15 that I, I basically pinpoint saying we have major problems here. We're going to have to deal with each of these issues if we hope to uh, either slow down the decline or arrest the decline altogether. This gives me some hope. I've been doing this math for over a decade, and what I do here is instead of putting in the state, I put in a, a nation state, which is basically producing about the same as the state every year. So you can see we're still very, very powerful. We're very diverse. We still have one state that ranks among the top nation states in the world, top ten, um, and that's uh, California, and, and I could just go down the list, and all 50 still would rank in the top 86 nation states in the world ranked by GDP. This gives me some hope. You know, we're so huge, we're so diverse that, you know, maybe we can get back on our feet and begin to move forward uh, in a rather rapid uh, manner. At mid-century, my notion is, uh, you know, look at the United States. We're going to continue to grow. We should have about 440 million people by mid-century, by 2050. Unlike what we're seeing going on in many parts of, of Europe, where there's going to be a population decline, Russia's already declining in population, Japan is declining in population, 
the U.S. will continue to grow, grow, and it will grow rather dramatically over the next four decades. And the thing to keep in mind about this, though, is that over 80% of all this growth will be due to immigration. The immigrants that come between now and 2050, their children and their grandchildren. So we're going to become more of an immigrant nation than perhaps any time in, in recent memory. We're going to probably become a majority-minority country by 2042. You know, there's not going to be a white majority. You know, we're going to have to learn more than ever before to get along and not worry about one's skin color or ethnicity or religion. You know, we're going to have to adapt. Uh, and we've done relatively well in the past with some major exceptions, but we're going to have to do even better uh, in the future and make sure that all these people get a proper education. Remember that most of the job entrants between now and 2050 are not going to be so-called whites. You know, we've got to make sure that everyone gets a decent education, decent training, so that we can compete effectively. In addition, we're going to be even more urbanized than we are now. We're over 80% urbanized now. Uh, in fact, uh, three-quarters of us live in communities with over th uh, a quarter million people. And we're actually going to become even more suburbanized as time goes on, and suburban areas will become much more self-contained in terms of a lot more jobs out in the suburbs, not having to commute as much into the uh, inner city. We'll remain a military superpower, but in many other dimensions, the U.S. will be a declining superpower in relative terms, and we're going to have to adapt to that. The big question is, you know, what will be the quality of life for the average American then? I'm hoping it's going to be good with innovations, with all that, even though our slice of the global GDP might, may be somewhat smaller, that pie will be larger. And if, with all the innovation that can occur, the quality of life for Americans can be good. But, you know, that will depend on how steep the relative decline will be. And we know a lot of our citizens today are worried. We know a plurality are saying that they fear that their children will not have as good a lifestyle as the, as the parents have had. We know that 60% of Americans say the country's moving in the wrong direction. It's been higher. It was much higher than that during the last year of the Bush administration. But you can see there's a malaise there. A lot of Americans don't like the term globalization. It's a pejorative term for them. But it's something that we're going to have to adapt to uh, very, uh, very uh, smartly uh, in, the, in the future. And lastly, I think that the fate of the U.S. as a superpower will largely be de uh, determined by the American people. You know, we have a history of resiliency. We've made it through the, the Civil War. Within a couple of generations, we would be the largest economy in the world. We made it through the double whammy of the Great Depression and World War II. At the end of uh, World War II, I argue that we probably were the most powerful nation ever to have existed in terms of our global reach. So we've been down in the valley before. The big question is that when are we going to begin to uh, dig our way out of the rather substantial pit that we have uh, developed for ourselves? So a lot of this will be on the shoulders of the American people. There are potential weaknesses in all of the potential competitor nations and groups of nations that I uh, highlighted at the beginning. They're not perfect. And, um, but I worry that we might succumb for too long to the Linus Van Pelt lament. Now, uh, many of you remember Linus Van Pelt from the Peanuts uh, a comic strip, and Linus had the famous phrase that there's no problem so big that you can't try to run away from it. And we've been doing a lot of running recently, <clears throat> and we've got to face up to the, these problems. And, uh, you know, for example, if you're looking at uh, what we're doing as a government, our government spending this year alone, this is the federal government, this is not taking into account state and local governments that spend about a couple trillion dollars a year themselves, but government spending this year would rank as the fourth largest economy in the world in terms of GDP. Only the United States and China and Japan spend more than we're going to, excuse me, produce more than we're going to spend in Washington. And when you look at the, the deficit this last year, the, the, the year, fiscal year just ended, our deficit for last year alone was equal to the GDP of Canada, which is, uh, in 2009 was the 10th largest economy in the world. So you can see, you know, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to adapt. Our, our uh, total gross government debt has now surpassed $13 trillion dollars. 
and to put that as a percentage of GDP, well, this year, at the end of this year, the gross debt as a percentage of GDP will be larger than we had in 1944 when we were fighting World War II. And the only years in our history where it's been higher than that will be 45, 46, and 47 at the end of the, those years. And at that time in 44, and in 45, 46, 47, we could look forward to the end of the war and getting back to a civilian economy. Now what do we have to look forward to? Well, we've got the huge debt that our workers will be uh, have to take care of. And remember, we're down to about two a little bit more than two workers per retiree by 20, excuse me, three workers per retiree. By 2030, we'll be down to close to two workers per retiree. And what do they have to look forward to? Well, this huge debt that will have to be financed and also about 80 million baby boomers, which will be, uh, who will begin to retire very soon and collecting full Social Security and full uh, Medicare. And this is a double whamming upon our workforce, my kids, my grandkids, your kids, that we're going to have to uh, deal with. And we're not to the point where we're dealing with these issues adequately. And if we can't take care of our economic foundation, if we can't take care of our fiscal foundation, then you can see that our role in the world, whether it be military or diplomatic or whatever, it's going to take a hit. It's going to take a hit because through the years, one of our strong points in terms of our international involvement has been our, very, our huge economic foundation compared to the rest of the world. And now we're to the point where that is beginning to diminish somewhat. And unless we get on our feet and take some very, very significant actions, we're going to see a decline which is steeper than most Americans would ever foresee. Thank you very much. Hold your book up, Earl. Oh, yes, one more time. <clears throat> there we go. Lament for America. And I should <laughs> add the books are, <clears throat> for those of you who are here, the books are on sale out front. And for those of you who are not here, I'm sure you can get them on Amazon. Yes. Um, so, uh, well, thanks, Earl. That was, I hope we can get into some uh, posi <laughs> positive uh, aspects of um, maybe some of your suggestions so we're not left in the ditch. But meantime, let's turn to Brian and his views on Canada. somebody's calling. Um, that was very interesting, Earl. Thank you very much. A great uh, segue to, um, to uh, what I would like to talk about this morning. Um, let, me, um, uh, let me start by saying that um, uh, my book is called The Canadian Century, co-authored with uh, Jason Clemens and uh, Niels Veldhaus. There it is. Um, and um, some people have uh, said, oh, so you think that uh, Canada is going to overtake America? No. Uh, I, the suggestion is not that uh, we are going to change places uh, in that sense. But uh, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, how Canada has evolved in the last few years in a way that I think uh, places us in a position of relative strength compared to the United States in a way that we have not seen uh, in many decades. And um, uh, listening to Earl's story about uh, how America has uh, changed over the last few years and the challenge that it faces, uh, I might be so bold as to suggest that America might find in Canada an example of a country that has actually wrestled with some of the problems that he's described and done so successfully. And um, uh, uh, we'll perhaps have a chance to talk about why Canada was able to do so successfully, whereas America has not yet. Where, uh, but I should also say that I'm a great optimist about America, and I know that America will overcome these problems. And if Canada can help by offering a positive example, I think that would be uh, terrific. So let me, uh, let me explain why I called the book The Canadian Century. Um, uh, every Canadian school child, I hope, is told that uh, uh, in the first part of the 20th century, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, one of our greatest uh, early prime ministers, said that the 20th century would belong to Canada. He said the 19th century had been America's century, uh, but the 20th century was going to belong to Canada. And uh, we got to the end of the 20th century, and many of us wondered, um, you know, w w what could he possibly have meant? Because we didn't feel like we owned the 20th century. And uh, 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 we, we went back and looked at what Laurier had to say, and what we discovered was he wasn't just talking through his hat. Laurier actually had a plan uh, 
about what he thought Canada needed to do in order to make the 20th century belong to Canada. And um, the argument we make in the book is the reason that the 20th century did not end up belonging to Canada was because we lost sight of the Laurier Plan. It was only at the end of the century, for reasons that I will talk about in a moment, that we actually got back on track. We scratched in the bottom of the drawer in the National Archives and found the plan and put it back to work. And by God, it actually, uh, it actually does uh, what Laurier said. Uh, um, Laurier, uh, just uh, to give you a little bit of context, Laurier presided over the probably the greatest period of prosperity Canada's ever known. When he came to power, there was one transcontinental railway. When he left office, there were three. When he came to power, we were growing 17 million bushels of wheat on the Canadian prairies. When he left, we were growing 117 million. He presided over the largest peacetime voluntary movement of people uh, uh, probably in the history of, um, uh, of the world. Uh, uh, he allowed into Canada uh, the same number of people that are coming into Canada today, uh, uh, today a population of 34 million. When he was prime minister, a population of six or seven million. He was letting the same number of people in. A uh, uh, huge expansion. Uh, Montreal and Toronto doubled in size. Uh, Winnipeg quintupled. Cities that had never existed before sprang up like mushrooms on the prairies, places like Saskatoon and so on. Uh, so, um, you know, when he uh, said the 20th century would belong to Canada, he was actually presiding over uh, the kind of stupendous growth and dynamism and energy that would make one think that actually a century could belong to Canada. Uh, now, many things happened uh, after Laurier left office, um, but uh, let me explain to you what he thought Canada needed to do, and then we'll talk about how uh, Canada got off track. Uh, the basic elements of the Laurier Plan, pretty straightforward. He said, first of all, you have to understand the most important thing about Canada. And this may be surprising to an American audience, uh, but if you know anything about Canadian history, this is totally consistent with, uh, with uh, the, the, the founding history of Canada. He said, the most important thing about Canada is when you come to Canada, you're free. Canada is a place unlike the places where uh, people are flocking from to come to Canada, uh, you know, your place in the world is not determined by your, your, your place in the social order. Uh, there's no uh, aristocracy here. It's not determined by birth. It's not determined by your parents. It's not determined by region. It's not determined by language. It's determined by what you do with yourself. And Laurier said that, um, uh, I, I think I'm pretty close to the exact quotation, he said, for 75, nay, the next 100 years, Canada will be the star towards which people of, uh, who love freedom and progress shall navigate. So that was number one. Number two, he said, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to have government do the right things in order to succeed. And he thought that um, there was a very specific list of things. He said government has to be small. He was a limited government advocate. But he said government has to do the right things. Uh, he believed that uh, one of the corollaries of Canada being a land of freedom was that people had to be responsible for themselves. He was a great opponent of the expansion of the welfare state. Uh, he thought you needed to keep uh, social programs well within uh, limits. He wanted to keep uh, public uh, finances uh, responsible. He was not an anti-debt zealot, but uh, he believed essentially, if I could put it in modern terms, that uh, you should only borrow to finance genuine infrastructure, something that would pay benefits over a long period of time. You never borrow in order to pay the day-to-day -day bills. Um, he thought that... Um, Canada's geography, its, its neighbours, its neighbourhood mattered tremendously. He said, you know, if I could put it in his kind of terms, um, history and providence have placed us next to America. And we cannot ignore that, and that is probably the most powerful force shaping Canada in many ways. Uh, and uh, therefore we need constructive engagement with the United States. We can't ignore them. We can't be hostile to them. We can't keep them out. Uh, and indeed, uh, America is a competitor with Canada for many of the good things that Canada needs to attract if it's to have its own century, people and capital chiefly. Uh, and so uh, Canada needs to engage positively with the United States, but needs to think about how to confer on itself advantages relative to the United States because the U.S. has certain advantages, uh, you know, it's got a better climate, it's got a larger population, all these things. Canada needs to think about 
how it can compensate for that. And again, this may surprise an American audience. One of the things that he said that Canada absolutely needed to do, and this became a bedrock piece of government policy right up until the 1950s, uh, Canada always needed to have a taxation burden that was lower than the United States. And, um, and this was uh, pursued, as I say, by successive uh, Canadian governments and taken as an absolute article of faith. Um, uh, the other piece of the puzzle, not just positive engagement with the Americans, but uh, he said uh, uh, we need to have free trade with the Americans. Um, we need to uh, uh, have their markets open to us. And uh, Laurier was a, an ardent free trader. In fact, uh, before he came to office uh, the previous election, he was defeated uh, on the issue of, he, he advocated total uh, unambiguous, unqualified free trade with the world. Um, he didn't win on that one, but um, uh, he ultimately came to power. Um, having put a little bit of water in his wine, he moved uh, to tariff reform in order to open the border, get the politics out of the tariffs. He was a big tax reformer. Um, uh, but um, uh, it was only at the end of his uh, uh, time in office that he was actually able to put on the table free trade with the United States in the 1911 general election. He actually went down to defeat on the issue of, uh, of uh, free trade. So that was the Laurier plan. Um, uh, and uh, while um, many things intervened uh, 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 after Laurier left office uh, that were beyond our control, Russian revolutions, worldwide depressions, two world wars, uh, all of which knocked us off course in various ways. It was only when we got to the second half of the 20th century that we began to do things uh, that were under our control that dragged us so radically away from Laurier's plan for us. And that, that's where I'd like to um, concentrate the rest of my remarks. Um, let me uh, put it in a comparative context for you. In 1960, um, the United States was spending 28% of GDP on government at all levels. So that's federal, state, municipal, 28% of GDP. Canada was spending 28% of GDP on government, federal, provincial, municipal. And we had been level pegging with the United States uh, on spending on government essentially for a century. And we had enjoyed uh, similar levels of uh, economic growth and um, uh, so on. Uh, by 1993, America, which uh, in the intervening years, of course, had fought the war on poverty, put a man on the moon, fought the Vietnam War, uh, uh, done a whole bunch of other things, uh, and spent, by the way, the same share of GDP on publicly financed health care as Canada, 7% of GDP. Uh, by 1993, America had gone from that 28% in 1960 was spending, I think it was 34, 35% of GDP on government. Canada had gone to, anybody know? 53. 53. Um, the uh, Wall Street Journal was writing editorials that uh, calling Canada an honorary third world country for the way it ran its finances. Um, we had the same kind of entitlement issues that uh, the United States did. We had uh, our Canada Pension Plan, the equivalent of Social Security, was essentially teetering on the edge of uh, insolvency. Uh, we had uh, a social welfare program that was essentially out of control in our wealthiest province, Ontario. Twelve percent of the population was in receipt of social welfare benefits, our wealthiest province. Um, uh, we were running uh, uh, consistent, uh, repeated deficits at uh, very high levels, uh, and uh, this was essentially dragging Canada down. And uh, um, so, in the book, um, we talk about something called the redemptive decade, the decade during which we got back on track for Laurier's plan, which I've described for you. Redemptive decade starts essentially in 1988 with the Free Trade Agreement. That was the first piece of the Laurier Plan, the, the building block that we put in place. Um, we began to uh, repair our relationship with the United States after um, you know, a long period of Foreign Investment Review Acts and uh, um, other uh, 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 nationalist uh, uh, um, excesses. Um, 
We began to reform taxes. As I said, Laurie was a big tax reformer. He believed that it was terribly important that you have the right structure of taxes as well as the right uh, total tax burden. Uh, GST tax reform uh, came a couple of years after the um, uh, after the uh, free trade agreement with the United States. Then uh, in uh, 1993, um, you get the Liberals come to office and uh, within two years they have uh, decided that uh, they are going to fix the public finance problems that I've described. Uh, and uh, I, I'll tell you what was done and then I'm going to tell you about the politics of it because I think that's the most important thing that maybe an American audience wants to take away from this. Um, uh, so uh, they uh, were stung into action. The, the proximate cause was, of course, that editorial in the Wall Street Journal I mentioned calling Canada an honorary third world country. That so upset people in Ottawa that they said, we cannot tolerate having Canada described in this way. Now, there was obviously a buildup of many other kinds of forces in Canada. That was just the tripwire. Uh, and what did they do? They uh, uh, put in place a, something called program review in which they subjected every piece of government spending to a searching review in which they asked a whole series, they, they set a series of tests for every piece of public uh, spending. They said, is this something government should be doing? If it's something government should be doing, is it something the federal government should be doing? If it's something that, uh, is it something that somebody else could do? If, if somebody else could do it, what would be the circumstances under which they could do it? And they just began to whittle away through a, an intelligent, rational process, not one of these processes where you say, well, we're going to take 10% off the top of every program, regardless of whether it's a good program or a bad program. We began to eliminate whole programs. Uh, in a way that uh, had never been seen before in Canada. Um, and uh, um, we began to turn the budgetary corner within, um, uh, within a couple of years. Uh, the budget had been balanced. And uh, uh, within um, a couple of years, we were starting to pay down debt as opposed to uh, building it up. And uh, the... Um, uh, the outcome, the payoff, that's always what's interesting. It's not so interesting, you know, fine, we did all these reforms, and by the way, we've, um, uh, just before I get to the payoff, let me mention that uh, uh, there are three great entitlement programs. Uh, uh, Earl's touched on them. Uh, uh, there's uh, public pensions, there's uh, public health care, there's social welfare. Um, uh, America fixed one of those, that's uh, social welfare. Canada fixed two, as say welfare and uh, uh, public retirement programs, so that uh, the Canada Pension Plan, the uh, chief actuary of Canada says that uh, the Canada Pension Plan is solvent for the next 75 years, and that doesn't mean something bad happens in 75 years, it's just he only projects out 75 years. Um, Health care is uh, largely left unreformed in Canada and uh, is the big challenge that we face for the future. Um, so let's talk about the payoff after the redemptive decade. Um, in the redemptive, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, essentially 15 years uh, following the uh, redemptive decade, um, we outperformed the G7 average on uh, employment growth. In fact, in most years, we tripled or quadrupled the G7 average in job creation. Uh, we uh, beat the G7 average in terms of in inward investment, and we beat the G7 average in terms of economic growth every year. Uh, and in most of those years, we beat uh, the U.S. on all of those measures as well. Um, so it can be done, uh, and uh, it's worth doing because it pays, uh, uh, it pays real benefits. Now let me talk, the uh, last part of my talk, about uh, the politics of all this. Because um, I think, actually, this is what distinguishes Canada from the United States more than anything else. Um, the politics of, um, of fixing our fiscal uh, problems um, were actually quite similar on both sides of the border. At the same time that uh, Canada was wrestling with its fiscal problems, America was successfully wrestling with its fiscal problems. What happened in Canada was you got a center-left government under Jean Chrétien, with Paul Martin as finance minister, uh, facing for the first time a center-right opposition that was fiscally responsible in the form of the Reform Party, uh, so that uh, the, the government in, in Parliament was constantly having to respond to a party that was pushing them towards fiscal responsibility. That political constellation was, I think, vital uh, 
to uh, Canada's success. What was happening in the United States at the same time, you had uh, Bill Clinton, a center-left president facing uh, a Republican majority in the House of uh, Representatives under Newt Gingrich, um, waiving the contract uh, for America. Uh, and that political constellation produced the first uh, balanced budgets that had been seen in a generation. And I understand from uh, um, uh, some books that I've read that uh, Clinton and Gingrich were close to announcing a deal on social security reform. So the same kind of political configuration in the United States was producing similar kinds of reforms. Uh, it was just Monica Lewinsky that knocked America off course. Uh, and, um, um, you know, uh, I'll leave it to you to decide uh, whether or not uh, there were other uh, factors at work. Um, uh, in Canada, um, I've heard it said that uh, by Americans that, well, you know, of course, you have, you have parliamentary governments, so as soon as somebody has a majority, um, you can do whatever you like. Uh, power is diffuse in America, so there's no possible comparison between Canada and the United States, and that's just nonsense. Let me take the example of the Canada Pension Plan, uh, which we fixed. Um, Canada Pension Plan is an agreement between the federal government and nine of the provinces. The federal government cannot unilaterally fix the Canada Pension Plan. We had to get nine provinces governed by every other political party in Canada besides the, the, the Liberal uh, government in uh, Ottawa. You had New Democrats, you had Conservatives, as well as Liberals at the table, and they worked across the political divide and they worked across the federal-provincial divide to fix that problem because they thought that it was in the interest of Canadians to do so. I'd also point out that... Um, the fiscal reforms in Canada didn't just take place at the federal level, they also took place at the provincial level. And by the way, the first province to, um, to start to fix its fiscal problems in the same way that Ottawa fixed its uh, was actually Saskatchewan under the NDP. Um, Roy Romano came to power, uh, he said Saskatchewan is a Cree word for too many hospitals. Uh, he had to close 75 rural hospitals in one day. Um, uh, I mean, these were huge and hugely difficult reforms, especially for a social democratic party. But what happened in Canada was the entire political class decided that there was a set of problems here that needed to be fixed because it was in the interest, the national interest of Canadians that they be fixed. Uh, and our ability to reach across the partisan divide and decide that those problems could and should be fixed and that we wouldn't use fixing these problems as a way to pillory our political opponents was, in my view, one of the key factors that allowed us to achieve what we have achieved. Um, that's probably enough for now. I'm sure that there are many other things that uh, will arise from my talk that you'll want to discuss, but I want to make sure I don't go too far over time. Oh, no, Dave. that's a good start. <clears throat> and I saw Earl scribbling away, and I have some notes too, but why don't I throw it back to Earl? Um, Well, I think that, uh, you know, this is encouraging. You know, there, the, I, my next book, I, I want to call it Renaissance America, you know, basically where we learn our lessons. And there's certainly lessons that can be learned from Canada. Uh, you know, I, I think we can learn lessons from the rest of the world in terms of, uh, you know, having pretty livable cities, uh, good mass transit systems, uh, good train systems, uh, uh, affordable Wi-Fi, which is available to, to everyone, fast Wi-Fi. And health care, you know, and here we see, you know, Canada came together and, and you know, Brian's right, you know, you could say, well, you know, it's a parliamentary government, as long as you have a majority, you do whatever you want. Well, here's the Canada pension plan and you had to have nine provincial governments sign on from a variety of political parties. And so that gives me some hope, you know, that with all the problems that we have, as long as we're sort of humble and basically, first of all, recognize that we have a problem. That my book will be a success if people basically say that those 15 fault lines or whatever, these are problems we need to face up to them. As long as they do that, I feel it will be a success. They may not agree with my solutions, like because there's a variety of solutions out there, but they have to say these are problems. Let's take care of them now. Are there real-world examples out there that we can learn from? Yes. Look north of the border. Look over to Europe for a few things. Look at Asia for a few things. Look at some of our best practices within our own state and local governments. And let's begin to adapt them and to move forward. So, you know, as much as I was sort of a downer and talking about our problems, there's still the possibility of, uh, you know, mourning in America, as Ronald Reagan, I guess, would have said many years ago, that uh, 
we can still move forward and there's good tangible examples out there for us to learn from. Well, something that struck me in, in your early remarks was um, the whole concept of change kept coming up. And I'm just wondering, do modern Americans have a hard time adapting to change compared to their predecessors? And at the same time, are we reluctant to look at others um, to find solutions? I mean, you know, we're Americans. Why should we look at Europe? Why should we look at Canada for possible solutions to our problems? No, this is, that's right. The mindset has to change uh, um, because we have to change. I, I spent a lot of years in, in Europe and in Canada, and I was, uh, began living in France uh, in the late 60s, and I said, oh, this is very nice, but these guys are never going to catch up with us as they took their Solexes and Mobilettes you know, to, to work out in the provinces and had their two-hour lunches. And then I kept going back to France as time went on. I said, ah, oh, they're just never going to catch up with us. You know, They're making progress, but they're never going to catch up. Well, I lived in Paris a couple of years ago again and said, that, you know, in some ways they really have caught up with us. You know, It's amazing. Uh, and, uh, you know, another reason, sort of an impetus, that was part of the reason why I wrote the book, uh, because I saw, hey, they're catching up. And the other thing, I grew up in California, you know, and th these were heady days in California. When I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, we had good public schools. We were able to balance budgets. We had a very modern infrastructure. And we used to say, well, as California goes today, the nation will go in a decade. Boy, if that's the case, we're in trouble. Because I go back to California every summer for two two months down in the San Diego area, and uh, you know they can't balance a budget. They got a twenty billion dollar budget deficit. They still don't have a budget in place, and that was supposed to have been in place in July one. The bond rating of California is now at the same level as Lebanon, as Lebanon, and uh, uh, public schools in a variety of cities are just not functioning the way that they need to. And so, how could how could we have paradise plundered like that, you know, out in my own home state? And, uh, you know, we're just going to have to wake up to the fact that we have things to learn from others. We've dug a deep hole, and we're going to have to get used to change like we've never seen change before. Uh, we have a, our infrastructure. We have a pretty good late 19th, uh, 20th century infrastructure. We're in the 21st century now. And you've been to China lately or to Singapore or you're looking at the infrastructure there. Last year, I, a couple of years ago, I went to the American Political Science Association meetings in Boston. I love Boston. I was taking the, the uh, sort of the, the subway out to the airport, and I had to make a change. And it was at the end of August, and, uh, you know, they didn't have any air conditioning there. In fact, they had a big fan sitting out on the, uh, on the platform, people walking past this big fan. That was providing the... You know the the cool, uh, the coolness for the for, for the passengers waiting to change. Well, you don't see that in a lot of subway systems around the world any longer. And I think that we have gotten complacent. I think we feel that we will always be number one. It's just sort of destined in the stars, and you know just just keep moving the way we've been moving. But in actuality, some are moving faster than we are. Our public education system, where we used to be number one in the world, the first major nation to have public schools, you know, in, in most comparative tests now, we've fallen to the, uh, to the 18th or 19th in the world, and the trend is not good because our fourth graders do pretty well, our eighth graders do not do nearly as well, and our 11th and 12th graders do worse of all. So the longer you're in school, the further behind we, we fall. And uh, even our, our you know, colleges and universities, which we think are still the best in the world, in many respects are, when it comes to graduation rates, we've now fallen to number 12 in the world. So somewhere along the line, David, I think you're right. You know, we sort of, you know, the notion we're always going to be number one. Everyone else needs to learn from us. We don't have to learn from them. But that mindset has, had, has to change because we've got to roll up our sleeves again and begin to say we've, met, we've made some mistakes. Let's correct those mistakes, learn from others, and begin to move forward. And one thing I wanted to pick up with Brian was the notion of politics. I mean, we're certainly steeped in it right now. We've got an election coming up in a month. But sort of how you, you talk about how it, things got turned the corner in Canada was with the liberal government being pushed by reform and some more conservative types. Is that the, the solution? I mean, could a we, – we had a rather conservative government here sort of being pushed and, and nothing – they just spent more money. Um, 
So does it take a conservative go uh, opposition pushing a uh, sort of a more liberal government to make this happen? I mean, as in Clinton or? Well, I, I mean, I, I simply observed that uh, in the 90s, there was a political configuration on both sides of the border that seemed to be capable of producing the kind of outcomes that we wanted. Now, I, I'm not, uh, please don't get me wrong, I'm not making any uh, 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 suggestion that uh, uh, of what a desirable outcome is in the the okay, coming every, American election. Every public thing says people are asking, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> uh, what, I, what I will observe is that uh, I think uh, that uh, since that period that uh, I described in the United States, politics has become uh, more rancorous. The, ability, the, the issue is not, you know, uh, is it Republicans in the House and Democrats in the, in, in the White House? It's can the whoever's in the White House and whoever's in, the, uh, in, in Congress agree to work together across partisan divides in the interest of solving national problems. It's that that I don't see. I mean, if you look at uh, California, I think one of the reasons it's got into such incredible uh, trouble is because of the obdurate, rancorous nature of the partisanship in the, in the legislature and the inability of anybody to find a way to make those uh, political forces work together. So. The issue, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but you know, the thing that maybe you could learn a little bit from Canada is niceness. Okay, just just to just to reinforce your prejudices about Canada, <laughs> uh, um, nice works, uh, and um, you know, there's uh, there's an extent to which um, uh, Canadian politics is getting a little nastier, and I can't say that it's been good for Canada. Um, so. Uh, it's, it, uh, I, I'm not making any claims for any political parties in the United States. All I'm observing is that as long as they promote uh, their narrow partisan interests over the national interest, you will never solve these problems. I've got some more things in my mind, Mike, but why don't I open up to you folks and we'll, we'll, we'll go here and then in the back. And the microphones are coming. <clears throat> My name is Stephen Shore. My questions for about both Canada and the U.S. It refer, um, are related to the human life cycle. You could have the the figure would the age at which people enter the workplace change, and if so, dramatically. It, and perhaps is there an ideal percentage of people who should go to college and those who should uh, start working earlier? And my second question is the what is the natural Will, will be the natural end of one's role in the workplace and the span between one's f um, finishing the work of uh, the working part of one's life and one's death and the other issue of oh, is productivity we, there, it's often of course the number of workers to retirees will decline but in theory if those in the workforce are productive enough if their productivity rises this would be mitigated or lessened as an issue. Would you like to start? Yeah, just a couple of things about that. Yeah, you know, productivity will, will certainly help, and we, up until the recent recession, you know, were among the leaders in the, in the world in terms of productivity growth, and that that will certainly help. In terms of the age issue. Uh, uh, First of all, we're going to have to make sure that our young people have a decent education uh, because I feel in the world there's three nations that have been particularly blessed in terms of their natural resource and energy bases, Russia, Canada, and the United States. And that's going to serve us well in the, in the future, but the most important resource of the 21st century, of course, is the human resource. And we've got to be able to keep up with brain power. So we, we need to have a high quality K through 12 as well as high quality uh, uh, university educations available. In terms of uh, retirement, I do think that our retirement age will continue to go up somewhat. I'm not so worried about Social Security, by the way. I can take care of the Social Security problem. You know, that's not too difficult in terms of up the retirement age a little bit, look at the payroll tax, increasing it in certain areas, and uh, but it's the, uh, it's the Medicare that gives me the difficulty. And of course, that goes back to health care. And, you know, it's amazing how little we've done in that area. You know, Brian was talking about going back 
a few decades ago, we actually were spending the same as Canada as a percentage of GDP on health care. We'll look at us today. We're spending close of 18, uh, to 18 percent of our GDP on health care. No one else in the Western world spends more than 12 percent. Several of them are spending single digits on health care. They cover all of their people. We have 50 million Americans without any health insurance at all. For me, that's a tremendous disconnect. We're spending twice per capita on health care as the other major Western nations. And for me, that, that's, there's two problems there. One is the equity issue. If they can cover all their people, why can't we cover all of our people? Why do I have a 26-year-old daughter who's a college graduate and who's working full-time? She doesn't have health care because co her company does not offer health care. Her previous company did, but it didn't make it through the recession. I think that is a key problem. The other one has to do with competitiveness. If we're going to spend so much more on health care than anyone else, well, it means that we're not spending in other areas. And why did the big three automakers, who aren't so big these days, but why did the three automakers for much of the past decade manufacture more cars in Ontario than they manufactured in uh, Michigan? Because they could save on average about $1,000 per car up in Ontario just in health care costs. So it's basically an invitation to offshore our jobs if we don't get a handle on health care. And that's one I, I applaud President Obama because we've been trying to come up with a comprehensive health care package since Teddy Roosevelt. He was the one that first talked about let's have comprehensive health care. The problem is it's not a very good bill, and particularly in terms of cost containment. On the other hand, he took on five of the most powerful interest groups in the country. You know, looking at the AMA and, and the hospitals and looking at the trial lawyers and the pharmaceuticals and looking at the insurance companies. And maybe now that at least we have something, we can begin to tinker with it and make it a good health care package. But that's one when you look at age and things like that. I, in terms of that Medicare and for all those baby boomer, boomers that are going to be retiring, that's one I can't handle unless we begin to have major reform in health care. And we're not at that uh, point yet. So you're absolutely right. More productivity is going to help. More GDP growth is going to help. But we still have to look at significant reforms in terms of uh, retirement benefits, in terms of health care benefits. And, uh, you know, as I said, we'll probably be working in, in the future decades to at least 70, if not beyond that. But eventually people will retire. We need to make sure that they have a decent uh, quality of life. But we also have to make sure that the burden on those who are working, whether they join the, the workforce at 18 or 26 after completing their uh, university education, that we're not putting too much of a burden on them in terms of taking care of the rising tax burden as well as the rising uh, entitlement burden that we'll put on a relatively smaller group of, uh, of working class people, working age people. Well, you've, you've asked a whole series of questions. I won't be able to answer all of them uh, with respect to Canada, but I, 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 since we're holding up books, I'll just say you, you've actually asked about my previous book, which is called uh, Fearful Symmetry, because it's all about demographic change and uh, its, impact on, its impact on Canada. Let me just uh, give people a little bit of uh, the, the compar comparison between Canada and the United States. Over the last 50 years, because Canada had the largest baby boom in the Western world by far, um, our labor force grew by 200 percent. Um, just to give you the point of comparison, in the United States, your labor force grew um, uh, 125 percent, if I remember correctly. So we were half again as big in terms of our labor force growth over the last uh, 50 years. In the next 50 years, America's labor force will grow 30 percent and Canada's will grow 11. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're going to have basically neutral labor force growth over the next 15 or 20 years. Uh, and so um, we're uh, now uh, Europe's in much worse shape. Canada's kind of, as so often the case, in the middle somewhere between America and uh, Europe. But uh, that's the Canadian situation, uh, and that's going to have very major impacts on uh, on Canada. Um, it's going to affect uh, immigration. It's going to affect uh, um, um, retirement behavior, uh, I would argue. Uh, Canada has been relatively poor compared to a lot of OECD countries in keeping people over 55 in work. Uh, that's going to change. In fact, it's already changing. We're going to have to uh, reform a number of uh, social programs, I think particularly about unemployment insurance, which uh, 
uh, still pays uh, too many people not to work. We won't be able to afford that. We're going to have labor shortages of very significant size. Um, uh, productivity is the real big problem for us. I've, I, I painted for you today a picture of how Canada's struggled, I think quite successfully, to get the macro picture right. The micro picture in Canada is a mess. Uh, and um, our productivity performance is scandalously bad uh, compared to uh, the United States, which uh, in my view really is the, for us, is the model we must learn from. Uh, and um, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we uh, need to do in order to get uh, productivity back on course. Um, uh, you asked about uh, post-secondary education. Um, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a, um, uh, I'm at least an agnostic about this. I, I think that uh, we um, uh, put too much emphasis on post-secondary education and not enough emphasis on the kind of post-secondary education. I've I, I got to tell you that uh, it's not very popular to say, but uh, you know, a degree in philosophy and a degree in, I don't know, computer science or you know, a, a, a trade uh, school certificate in uh, uh, you know, electrical uh, engineering, whatever, um, these are not of equal value to Canada. Uh, they're not going to be of equal value in the future. And um, I, I will just observe that um, uh, the part of Canada which uh, has uh, the highest rate of high school dropouts is Alberta, which is the place with the hottest economy and the lowest unemployment rate. The place with the highest high school completion is New Brunswick, which uh, has you know some of the highest unemployment and a very, relatively speaking, underdeveloped economy. Um, uh, they they leave high school in Alberta because there's more valuable things for us to do with them. Um, now, will they need later to find ways to upgrade their education, uh, improve their skills? Absolutely. Uh, is it obvious that uh, we must force people to get as much education as they can before moving out in the workforce? I actually think that that's a holdover from a uh, baby boom mentality when we had so many young people, we didn't know what the hell to do with them. And, and universities became holding tanks uh, in an era of labor constraint, I don't think it's going to work that way. François. <clears throat> François Vaillancourt, Economics, Université de Montréal. Just two compliments on Brian's excellent presentation and a question to Earl Fry. The compliments for the American uh, listeners. Uh, how do we get in the mess that Brian described from 28 to 53 percent of government spending of GDP? Well, one item that you may want to be aware of is I would call the oil illusion of the early 1980s, where we expected the price of oil to go to 100, 120, 150 U.S. dollars per barrel and to go up forever and ever and to be shared between Alberta and the federal government. And... Bountiful amounts would come to everybody, the surplus would arise, the deficit would be slayed, that would be paid off. Well, people know the oil price had dropped to $10 a barrel by 1987. So it took us about 10 years to correct from that wrong forecast, because Brian's quite correct, by 95 we woke up and said, what do we do? So just illusions can actually have a, a long lag in the system just because you made one mistake and it forecasted it wrong. Now, the interesting point on the correction, um, Brian mentioned the Wall Street Journal article. I remember going to a meeting at RPP 1994 with something from the IMF. And one background issue was the IMF intervening in Canada. The last country it had been into a developed one was Great Britain. It would have been a very shameful thing to happen. But the interesting question from the American politics perspective, if I may <laughs> just wait in 30 seconds, the left-right dimension, our deficit shot up again when the right took power in Canada in 2006. The right seems to be good at spending public money, and the left seems to be good about not spending public money. So perhaps in, Canada, in the U.S., uh, a leftist president and a rightist Congress is better than a rightist president as you had with Bush beforehand. Uh, empirically speaking, in terms of controlling the... Uh, the deficit. I don't know why, just an observation. In Canada, that's what we have right now. We have a right-wing minority government, right-wing being relative to Canadian politics, and it has one of the largest deficits in the last 10 years. Okay, the, the uh, American questions uh, to Professor Fry. Uh, 
Um, listening to you is very, very interesting. I guess I have two questions, one international one and one domestic one. The international one, if it is a reduction in relative term of the U.S. superpower role, which I think makes sense, is, is this good or bad for the U.S. and the world? Why would I want the U.S. to remain as strong a superpower? I mean, am I better off with a stronger Chinese superpower or a, a stronger Indian superpower, relatively speaking? Um, I ask that as a neighbor, because one of my key concerns as an economist is that America's decline has a terrible impact on Canada. The first slide you put up with the 33 percent drop in export illustrates that perfectly. But more generally, should I mean, some people would argue that U.S. superpower is not that great for its neighbors or, its, or people outside of the U.S. So, I mean, should I be concerned about that or not? Would, would being constrained by the U.N. be a good thing or a bad thing? The domestic question for the U.S., what fascinates me as an economist, is that amongst the, uh, the 15 fault lines, which you very briefly put up, I think I saw four or five which were public sector linked, you know, international debt, the deficit, federalism, and so forth. And you pointed out the issue of destructive uh, capitalism, the Schumpeter approach of job churning and so forth. I would argue that if we take a 50-year perspective, the relative share of human capital compared to physical capital in the production of private goods in the U.S. has gone up um, for all sorts of changes in, in the structure. When human capital goes up, does that create a larger role for non-business income protection scheme? And I deliberately say non, because I don't say government, because you can imagine compulsory private co-op or compulsory reinsurance scheme. But you look at the issue Brian just alluded to, uh, ongoing lifetime learning or ongoing lifetime education, health and pensions. When you have your pensions linked to your employer and when you have your health system linked to your employer, as was the case of GM, then you have a very strong urge to resist mobility both uh, between firms across sectors and everything else. And from that perspective, the Canadian system, where at least health is not linked to an employer, creates much easier mobility within the labor market. But does that have to be public? I'm not sure. Could one imagine a cooperative system, for example, which was the original German idea in the 19th century? And from that perspective, Obama's health reform, with due respect, is bad. It entrenches, it entrenches the use of employer-supplied health care. It does not facilitate mobility, I think, across employer, as would have been, for example, offering every American the possibility of joining Medicare at any age. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. In terms of the international uh, dimension, the United States today spends about half of what the entire world spends on defense, about one-half of what the entire world spends on defense. That's going to be unsustainable over the, uh, uh, in the foreseeable future. We just cannot uh, continue to spend uh, that much money. And there's going to be a reckoning uh, there. Uh, we need to do more in diplomacy. We've had three people recently say that there's too much military in U.S. foreign policy. And those three people were Bill Gates and and Petraeus, General Petraeus, and also Admiral Mullen. All three of them said that there's too much military in U.S. foreign policy. We're going to have to do much more in the diplomatic area. I was, had the opportunity to be with Secretary uh, Clinton the other day, and the question I wanted to ask her, we'd had time, was you know, she, she talked about her vision, and it's going to be we're going to consult more uh, with our, our allies. And I said, I think that's a good idea, but you know, looking at the problems we're facing at home economically and the fact that you have fewer foreign service officers than there are people playing in military bands in the U.S., don't you think that uh, you have some problems in front of you, that you probably need an increase in resources? And in, indeed, Secretary of Defense Gates has said that maybe some of the resources in the Pentagon need to be transferred over to state. Yeah, there's going to be some changes. Uh, with those changes, it means that we cannot be as unilateral as we used to be. It means that we're going to have to listen more to what others tell us and have to adapt, adopt some of what they ask us to do. And so things are going to get messier. They're going to get messier because for a long time, the U.S. has been a really rather benign superpower. 
we've met our share of problems, but we've been relatively benign as superpowers go historically. And so it's going to be messier. Others are going to have to step forward, other nations, and pick some, up some of the burden. Burden sharing is really going to have to go into vogue. We cannot do as much as we've been doing. We cannot be the global policeman to the extent that we have in the past. And so there's no doubt uh, international relations will be cloudier as time goes on because the one superpower has to draw back somewhat. In terms of the domestic thing, let me just say something about households. And households are hurting in the U.S. You're all households, okay? A couple of things. First of all, we have a huge concentration of wealth into relatively few households. We're back to 1928 levels. We have 1% of households accounting for 34% of all the private wealth in the U.S. We have 1% of households that are almost getting it almost close to a quarter of all annual income. That, we haven't had that in a long, long time. And when you see this concentration of wealth and combine it with decisions like the Supreme Court one on Citizens United where in the political arena, whether we're talking about uh, financing campaigns or even carrying it over to lobbying activity, where you can do whatever you want now, in fact, you can do it basically without disclosure. My notion is, and particularly if we were to do away with the estate tax, you know, my notion is that we're in the process of creating an aristocracy based on wealth. It really tarnishes the whole notion of democracy and representative government. And we cannot allow that to happen. And particularly when you allow that wealth to basically uh, lap over into the political system and to buy influence. We can do a whole lot better than that. Whereas the average household is hurting. Most of the wealth of the average household is linked to three things, jobs. And, of course, they're worried about job security. When you take unemployment rate and unemployment rate today, we're up to about 16 percent. That's extremely high. The second source of wealth would be the equity in homes. Well, that's down about 30 percent from the high about three or three and a half years ago. If you're living in some of the sand states, such as Nevada or living in Las Vegas, 80 percent of all homeowners are underwater. They owe more on their uh, mortgages than they could sell their homes for. There's a lot of hurt there when it comes to, and remember they were using, a lot of these people were losing, using the growing equity in their homes as the ATM machines to consume. Can't do that any longer. And the third source would be their, uh, their pensions, and a lot of the pensions are tied into the stock market. The stock market is coming back, but not near the levels of uh, above 14,000 on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So a lot of people are saying, whoa, you know, we're going to get back, we're going to have a V-shaped recovery because the consumers will get back to spending, you know, over 70 percent of the GDP. I doubt that very seriously. And then what you were saying about health care is still largely tied to companies, and companies are pulling back. They're, mean, they're basically making their, all, their own employees pay more in terms of the share of the health care costs, more on co-pays. That's just more and more money going out of the pockets of, of the average American into health care. And when it comes to the pension plans, it used to be that a lot of our uh, large and medium-sized companies offered defined <laughs> benefit uh, pensions. You knew what you were going to get at the end of the day. Now we're to almost... You know, we're heading towards more and more defined contribution where the money comes from the employee in our 401ks, et cetera. They make the decisions on where to invest. And even a lot of the corporations that used to offer matching have now, during the Great Recession, decided not to offer matching. So you can see the average a household is hurting. You know, more and more of what they were hoping to get in terms of health care benefits, in terms of pension, it's coming out of their own pockets, out of their own hide now. And so, you know, the notion that they're going to be able to just pick up their spending like they did before the Great Recession, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And you're absolutely right in terms of portability. In health care, it would be better to have sort of a central or at least a state-by-state -state system than to have one that's tied to companies because a lot of people are not moving these days even though jobs may be available because A, they're underwater in their homes and B, are they going to get health care coverage? And do they have a kid that has a pre-existing uh, illness? And will they be able to change and still get that kid covered? It's a real mess that we put ourselves into in a country that historically has been among the most mobile in the entire world. And we've got to look at that very closely. Any comments from you, Brian, on Francois? <clears throat> it's always nice to get a compliment from Francois. <laughs> Joe? My name is Joe Dukert. 
I'm a senior associate at CSIS and an independent energy analyst. Um, first of all, I have sort of a question for David. Uh, I, I may have misread the initial announcement of this uh, session, but what I wrote in my book was uh, we were going to discuss the U.S. decline and Canada's rise and it came out a little more balanced on the rise or in decline question mark evaluating the two powers and I wondered uh, if there had been uh, if, if I just misread it uh, or if if there had been a, a slight change in uh, in focus nevertheless uh, I think that we have uh, heard generally speaking uh, optimism about Canada uh, and tempered pessimism about the United States uh, but Earl, you, you said something that uh, I like to quote next week when I speak in Calgary at a North American energy conference. You said, renewal will require widespread public awareness, commitment to major changes, and a large dose of short-term pain. Now, I, and in respect to uh, the energy environment situation, I, I would only modify that by saying to me, the short-term pain we are going to suffer in both countries as a result of trying to do something to cope with climate change will last at least a decade. And I think it will be more serious in Canada than it will be in the United States. And I, my question really is whether or not you uh, agree with that. It seems, it seems to me that when you uh, internalize an externality, which is what you have to do, uh, by uh, imposing a, a carbon a carbon tax or uh, a, a, a cap and trade or anything like that, uh, productivity is going to be hard uh, to prevent from declining. Also, I think we will cope. We have begun to cope, although we don't recognize it, uh, by by uh, by modifying uh, the rise in energy demand. And I think Canada. Uh, uh, which is heavily reliant on its exports of energy, uh, both uh, oil and natural gas, uh, is, is going to be hard-pressed because I think oil prices and energy prices generally will tend to stabilize. At the same time, costs will have to rise uh, in Alberta's production of, of, of energy. Uh, I, th I think that uh, it will be easier for the United States to restrain growth in demand for energy because we're so fat uh, in the way we use energy. Uh, Canada is, is ahead of us uh, in, in, uh, in demand management of various types. So all in all, in all, I'm pessimistic about the outlook for both countries uh, and I tie it not only to the very serious one that, that you mentioned about the cost of defense, uh, but uh, very largely to the response that's absolutely necessary to the threat of climate change. Um, well, Joe, it's nice to see you. Um, um, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I certainly think that uh, you know Canada is going to follow whatever lead America gives on uh, climate change. Uh, uh, our, the government has uh, clearly announced that uh, they will not move in advance of the United States and they won't do anything that will put us out of step with the United States. Uh, but uh, clearly when something happens, uh, we, will, we will be there and be part of the, part of the um, game. Now in terms of um, um, oil prices, well, you know, we've all got our predictions about oil prices. You're no doubt more knowledgeable than I am. Um, I will observe that if you, uh, if you look at the International Energy uh, Agency's uh, projections about uh, uh, the composition of energy use uh, and the size of energy use worldwide over the next uh, few decades, um, all energy sources uh, increase and um, uh, oil and natural gas uh, as much as, uh, as anybody. So there's, uh, there's going to be growing demand, um, at least in terms of the International Agen Energy Agency's uh, uh, projections. Um, uh, there's already quite a lot of interest in uh, Canada's hydrocarbon uh, resources uh, from uh, alternative markets to the United States, including from China. Um, I'm less pessimistic than you are about our ability to continue to um, to sell those resources. Plus, uh, you know, if we uh, end up having a carbon tax that ends up advantaging. 
uh, non-carbon rich uh, sources of energy like say hydroelectricity you know Canada is pretty well placed to be a, a major supplier and we're extremely well plugged into the North American network uh, sorry you want to You haven't talked to Danny Williams lately. Hydro resources, but will they be developed? That's, that's a point I should have mentioned about hydro. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, uh, the existing capacity, you're quite right, is essentially developed, but, you know, lots of spare capacity, undeveloped spare capacity, Manitoba, you know, Newfoundland. Uh, now, is it economic to bring it to market? That, you know, Danny Williams says yes, so I'm a little more skeptical. Uh, but, um, uh, I, I think the uh, the energy picture for Canada is, um, I, I wouldn't say it's on balance pessimistic. I'd say it's on balance neutral. But you know, these are judgment calls. So, I was, I was just in Edmonton last week giving some uh, lectures, and uh, uh, I'm grateful that Canada is is to our north and has what it has. And uh, I'm very concerned also about uh, climate change. But I'm, I'm happy that the oil sands are up there, and I know that things can be done to 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 make them more environmentally uh, suitable. But it's great to have a, a reliable, stable partner uh, to our north that can provide so much to us through the pipelines. And I hope that we down here in Washington don't blow it uh, in terms of trying to put so many uh, restrictions on that uh, that will that Canada will turn elsewhere uh, for uh, markets. Uh, so I, you're the expert on this, Joe. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping over time, of course, that we're going to innovate, 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 that we'll turn to alternative sources, we'll turn to more renewables. Uh, but it's going to be dicey, there's no doubt about it. And that could indeed have an impact upon our uh, productivity as, as we uh, look forward. Hopefully we'll adapt quickly and, and be able to move forward. Actually, Earl's made a, a point that I, I'd just like to follow up on, because uh, uh, um, in your analysis, Joe, you know, much of which I, I agreed with, I, I noticed you didn't put any uh, uh, emphasis on the uh, issue of the national security consequences of different sources of hydrocarbons uh, internationally. We know that uh, it's pretty unlikely that America is uh, going to be able to uh, wean itself completely off uh, foreign oil given, you know, the size of its consumption plus the available supply within the United States. Uh, so it's I going to... I want to let my question run too long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all I will observe is that uh, assuming that America is going to be importing oil from somewhere, there are a lot nastier places to import it from than from Canada. And, you know, if you're worried about... Uh, you know, uh, uh, American uh, oil purchases in the Middle East financing Islamic terrorism or, you know, purchases from Venezuela supporting, you know, autocratic uh, uh, regimes and so on. Um, you know, there's worse things than supporting Ed Stelmack, uh, who's the premier of Alberta. Uh, so I, I think that's a dimension that has to be included. Brian, I wanted to follow up on your your the title of your book you brought us pretty much to where we are today but their title implies looking forward in the 21st century and there's also sort of a subtitle of moving out of America's shadow and I would like you to expand on that if you could. Sure. Well uh, I mean I, I think it's uh, is pretty straightforward uh, deduction from um, uh, what I said about how things have developed. Uh, I, we're preparing a, uh, an infographic which on one page in a series of graphs lays out the story of the Canadian century and it sort of moves through time. And uh, the graph starts basically in 1960 and uh, you know charts that evolution that I describe. And so the, the, the part of the chart from 1960 to um, the redemptive decade to 1998 is labeled the gathering storm. Then you've got the redemptive decade, then you've got the, the period I described, which is the payoff, and then in 2007, uh, you've got the recession hits, government spending takes off uh, um, in both Canada and the United States, so that we got knocked off track. In fact, Americans are often very startled to learn that uh, had it not been for the recession, that government in Canada would have been smaller than government in the United States within a year or two. And uh, uh, if we get back on track, that will happen uh, in the not too distant future if we get back on their, our respective trends. And so from 2007 into the future, that section of the graph is called the choice. Uh, the argument that we've made in the book is that um, 
the redemptive decade uh, has positioned Canada to have its own century. Um, it has positioned Canada and, and the, the, the performance of the, uh, uh, the decade or 15 years after the redemptive decade was such that we, as I indicated, were regularly outperforming America on many kinds of uh, economic measures. This is before the recession, so uh, this is uh, independent of that. Uh, and so, you know, the argument is that you follow the Laurier plan in a modernized version and it does what he promised. Uh, but you have to stick with the plan. And uh, as anybody in the think tank world will tell you, I'm sure David uh, uh, would as well, no policy victory is ever permanent. Uh, and so one of the reasons we wrote the book to describe what had happened was not simply to tell the historical story, but also to lay out for people the consequences of the future choices yet to be made. It's easy to backtrack. Uh, it's easy, for instance, to turn on the spending taps for stimulus. It's very hard to turn them off, no matter what your declared intentions to do so. And uh, so we wanted Canadians to be uh, aware of the payoff from making the right policy choices, make them aware that uh, you know backsliding is a threat, and there's already been some backsliding, and um, we hope uh, to make them... Um, uh, um, demand of their politicians to stay the course for what they've started because it seems to be the right way to go. And if we do, then moving out of America's shadow is kind of a logical okay. consequence of that. Winston Wilkinson, I'm a student at uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, I actually have uh, a set of questions for, for both, uh, both panels. Uh, first, uh, Brian Crawley, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the U.S.'s decline. Um, and I guess the question I have to ask you is, where do you see, I guess, Canada's relative position? Um, obviously, the U.S. has declined somewhat. China obviously is rising. India is rising. Where, where does, where does uh, on a relative basis, where does Canada kind of fall out in that mix? And where do you see Canada 10, 15 years from now? Uh, on a relative basis as we look at other rising c countries as like Brazil and kind of, again, a decline of the, of the EU. Um, and kind of related to that question, um, on, a, on a trade basis, um, obviously you would assume if, if the U.S. economy is, is on decline, who, who are going to be Canada's kind of principal trading partners in, in the next, you know, 5, 10, 15 years? And then for uh, Professor, Professor Fry. Um, I was at an event a few weeks ago where uh, Dick Army mentioned that uh, you know his goal was to have ten Jim Dements in the Senate, <laughs> um, and, and Brian mentioned you know the importance of being nice. Uh, so as, as you think of that, and, and and you have a you know obviously a couple of sections on, I guess uh, Congress, w w how will that dynamic, if it plays out, impact? the U.S. Um, and then secondly, uh, you touched on this earlier about the U.S.'s need to, uh, to kind of reduce its burden and have others kind of share. Um, and as you, again, as the EU is declining, China's on the rise, India's on the rise, Brazil's on the rise, um, who should be our allies going, going forward? Um, um, you know, obviously, the EU has historically been, you know, most of our allies have historically been in the EU. But again, as they as they start to decline, who do you think uh, are the who are the, of the rising powers should we ally with? And uh, I, that's it. Thank you. There's a lot there. Uh, there is a lot there. You, uh, um, let me let me. I can't answer all of the things that you've uh, asked, but uh, let me give you a, a, a few key pieces of the puzzle. Uh, first of all, uh, your question is, uh, is, is terrific because it, uh, it gives me an opportunity to uh, make very clear that uh, I do not believe that uh, Canada's success can be built on America's failure. And indeed, much of the argument of um, Canadian century takes it as uh, given that America will recover from uh, the current uh, circumstances and will become uh, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, the dynamic, prosperous country that it has been for most of its uh, history. Um, I, I'm not saying it won't be hard to do. All, all I'm saying is that uh, we actually have um, strong faith based on uh, America's historical behavior uh, that uh, it will recover and uh, do extremely well. Canada cannot in my view, uh, prosper uh, uh, next to an America that is seriously hurting. I mean, Earl mentioned that, uh, you know, exports to the United States uh, from Canada were down by a third, I think uh, was the number, Earl. Uh, You've got to remember that Canada exports one half of everything that's produced in its private sector, and 80% of that goes to the United States. Um, uh, and uh, uh, one of the uh, themes of the book is actually the extent to which Canada and the United States have become intertwined. And my view is that Canada has not completely ceased to be a separate national economy, but it's much, much more an integrated piece of the North American economy than it is a separate national economy. By separate national economy, I mean, you know, the kind of place that, you know, where uh, they make uh, finished goods from beginning to end and export those finished goods to markets elsewhere. That's not what, not chiefly what Canada does. Canada chiefly is a piece of a North American production process that moves seamlessly across the border. As you may know, we have, the, and Earl has mentioned, we have the largest um, trading relationship in the world. But if you look in, you dig into that, you'll find that, for instance, 40% of the trade across the border is intra-company trade. In other words, it's pieces of a production process within a single company moving back and forth across the border. Uh, you'll, you'll know from our earlier exchange about energy that uh, Canada is deeply integrated into the American economy in terms of uh, energy. We're plugged into the continental energy, uh, the electricity grid. We're plugged into the pipeline grid for both uh, oil and natural gas. Uh, and so uh, Canada is not a a separate national economy that can easily divert, to use uh, the, the, the language that the nationalists back home use, uh, divert its trade from America to um, Japan or China or whatever, because that implies that we're selling finished products to America that we could instead sell to somebody else. That's l not mostly what we do. Uh, mostly what we do is we... Uh, you know, good good example is the space shuttle. You know, Canada doesn't make space shuttles. We're not big enough. Uh, but we do make important parts of the space shuttle, like the Canadarm. But we wouldn't be making Canadarms if North America wasn't making space shuttles. Uh, and, um, you know, we could use lots of examples from the car industry and others. So, um, uh, yes, Canada will seek out markets in other places. Yes, uh, you know, because of the rise of places like uh, Brazil and China and so on, we will doubtless be selling more, uh, perhaps especially natural resources, but also um, uh, services and some uh, manufactured goods. But uh, I, I, my view would be that uh, Canada's exports to the rest of the world are actually understated by our own trade figures because most of our exports to the rest of the world are actually buried in American exports to the rest of the world as a, as a piece of what America is making because we make things together. Uh, so uh, I think it's a mistake now for Canada to be thinking of itself as an independent actor in a large, uh, you know, globalizing world where we can just pick and choose who our partners are. We are, I think the die is cast on that. We are part of North America. We cannot escape that. That was part of Laurie's message. Uh, the, the biggest fact about it, Canada is America. Uh, and uh, we have to manage that relationship and we have to, America has to be prosperous for Canada to um, to succeed in the world. And let me add on that in terms of uh, you know the United States over time it doesn't mean the United States won't continue to grow and mm -hmm. we've already said that the US is going to grow substantially in terms of population. So it's still going to be a great marketplace for Canada. Uh, what we need to do is to look at thinning that border. We're about a decade out of 9-11 now. Or can't we take some tangible steps to, to basically, let's say, pre-clear most of the, uh, the goods coming across the border, pre-clear people coming across the border? There's a whole slew of things we could do to thin that border like it was prior to 9-11. To we need to be looking more as North Americans because out there across the two oceans south of Mexico, there's a lot more competition. Mm 
And we have a lot of things that we could be doing to rationalize our business and economic uh, activity in North America, and we're not doing it. As I said, you know, after NAFTA, nothing's going on, no big picture out there. We've got to be looking at a big idea and begin to think about implementing that. In uh, terms of uh, the Jim DeMint uh, comment, I want pragmatic problem solvers to come to Washington. I want people who will be statesmen and stateswomen more than politicians to basically say, we face a, a set of serious problems, let's work it out together. So obviously I'm looking at people that will work across the, uh, the aisle uh, and not the Jim DeMints of the world. If we're gonna solve the problems, if we get into having a whole slew of new Jim DeMints, then we're gonna have more gridlock. And the gridlock means that you're satisfied with the status quo. I'm not satisfied with the status quo. We've got to break out of that status quo. So I'm, I'm looking for a new type of politician to come to town that basically says, I'm an American citizen. I'm American above all. I'm going to solve the problems that the voters back home think I've gone too far too fast. They can turf me out, but I've done my share as a public servant. We don't have that mindset yet there either. And, and lastly, in terms of allies, my notion is whoever wants to be an ally with us and sort of agrees to the rules of the game for international conduct. In the list that you mentioned, there's no reason why we can't be allies with all those nations. But again, there's certain prescribed ways of doing things that we would expect them to do. You know, what we might see uh, coming in the, in the future is, and I think that you know, power is shifting to the uh, Asian uh, Pacific uh, area in terms of uh, GDP growth and population. Well. You know, maybe will they come together? Can China and Japan overcome their difficulties and, and sort of agree to do somewhat like the EU has done? Can they bring ASEAN on board, you know, the Korean Peninsula on board? That would be quite a dynamo in the future in terms of, uh, of an economic power. And, uh, and we hope to be a, a part of that, you know, that they're going to continue to have good relations with us. And Japan, instead of turning towards China totally, will also continue to look across the Pacific toward us, but it's going to be interesting because you're right, you know, our traditional allies are Canada, our traditional allies are the European nations, and there's no reason why they shouldn't continue to be, but as power shifts uh, eastward, you know, we need to be, or at least towards uh, uh, Asian area, we've got to uh, look at, uh, you know, what our new set of priorities will be, and quite frankly, and this is, you know, I'll finish with this because it's somewhat controversial, I would at least like to see us paying less attention to the Middle East area and more attention to Asia. In the Pacific area, because I think that's where, I think the Middle East area sort of represents uh, a quagmire for us in many respects. There's a lot of quicksand there, and not that we should leave, but you know, we need to maybe redefine our policies and how we're going to carry out our policies there and do much more in terms of what's going on uh, across the two oceans, uh, particularly with what's going on in Asia. There's going to be some really good opportunities for us if we wake up to it and take advantage of these opportunities. But that's a, that's a mindset sh a change again, because ever since World War II, we, we've been concentrating on Europe. We've been Europhiles, you know. And a lot of our uh, policy making has been centered in the Northeast. You know, it's easy to look across the Atlantic. Well, you know, things are really changing, and we need to have be, begin to broaden our horizons and look at what the new priority areas are, and I hope that that's what we'll be doing. So anyway, Winston, thank you for those questions. Anything else? Well, I'd like to thank our speakers today. I think it was an interesting discussion, and I think it's going to at least keep me thinking the rest of the day, and, and then some more. Um, upcoming, we have uh, next week, Gilles Duceppe, the uh, head of the Bloc Québécois Party in, in Canada, will be speaking here on Friday the 15th. On the 19th, we have a program on sort of sub-federal efforts at border and border security, um, which could be very, will be very interesting. And November 12th, China's role in the Canada-U.S. relationship in a variety of areas. And I hope you'll stay tuned. If you're not on our mailing list, please sign up. Um, we send it every two weeks, a very brief email that sort of lets you know what's going on in the program and in Canada-U.S. relations. And I hope to see you again. Thank you very much for coming, and have a good day. <clears throat>